Welcome to Fatima Today. Our special guest today is Peter Hanowski, Dr. Hanowski. Welcome back. Thank you very much for having me, Father. And uh, we've talked about a crisis in the church, crisis in uh, finance, or international finance, crisis in geopolitics, crisis in education. Perhaps we should talk about crisis in culture, yeah, common cool. everyday culture. Perhaps you can explain Common that. everyday culture, yes. And I think ultimately it has to do with the uh, pro collapse of our own religious spirit because you know the the word culture really comes from the word cultus and it has to do with the the cult the act of sacrifice and we know our western civilization has grown up around the mass that it's been it's been fed and it's really meant to augment the mass and it the mass is the life blood of that western culture that we have and since there's been a decline in appreciation and attendance and uh, cultivation of, of mass and our religion. Therefore, there's a decline and unraveling of our, the, the bonds and the cords which hold us together culturally. And be, when we think of that, we have to remember that there's so many... This is what the anti-traditionalist revolution has really accomplished. You know, whether you're talking about the neoconservative, the democratist or the uh, communist or any kind of radical revolution, what, what, what it accomplishes is, is it, that it unravels what has been the, the tight bonds that have connected us in so many subtle ways. Even, even the handshake, even the certain gestures certain appreciations of relationships within the family, when those things unravel, when that common understanding of how to be unravels, you have a real serious situation. I mean, even, even now, you, the, the common understandings of who opens the door for whom, uh, how do you address someone who's uh, you know, younger than you or older than you or of a higher rank, that's, that's gone, and that those acts of respect, when actually those acts of respect are a matter of justice, but we've forgotten that there is a hierarchy in reality, in society, in the church, in the state. We've forgotten that, or that's been denied. Therefore, all these subtle gestures that, and, and uh, words that we used to use to express our understanding that there is this hierarchy and I have to fit myself into it, that's all been rubbished. Yes, even something like say thank you is a simple thing, but somebody did something for you or gave you something, yes. to even say thank you is, is an act of culture. A, and the same thing for, yes, yes, Mr. So-and-so, or yes, you know, talking to an older person instead of saying hi, Bill, or whatever his yes. name is. Uh, that, that's uh, whereas with, among equals you can s call him Bill if that's right, his name. Right, absolutely. So people have to, uh, but these are uh, all these things. Uh, of course, I mean, in the Fourth Commandment is you know honor thy father and mother. Well, honor in in with their due respect all authority that that God has said in the world. Whether it's whether it's the policeman, whether it's the governor, whether it's the priest, whether it's the bishop, whether it's the pope whether it's whoever it might be, yeah. uh, whether in civil or religious society, or it's the abbot in, the, in, the, in a monastery and so forth. Right, and, and the ancients were very attentive to this. I mean, St. Thomas makes a distinction between four, three different virtues that people need to have, but they were all with regard to how I act toward another and what I owe to other people. And they were all, however, under the virtue of justice. This was owed. Justice is to give to another what is due yeah. to them by their state position and what you've, they've given you. So he makes a distinction. You know, there's some acts of justice that we can't repay those that have given something to us, like the act of religio, the act of religion. We can't repay to God what we owe him. And yet St. Thomas says that's why, we, since we can't repay him at all, for our existence, because we, we can't uh, come close to that. We have to, we, that's why it explains sort of the, the pomp and circumstance of religion, because we're trying to give all that we can. You're trying to show at least the respect with, within the, 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 our, due, our means. With our, within our means, in, in that act of worship. So too they talk about pietas, you know, this, yeah. this piety towards parents, towards country, towards those that, that deserve our respect in that way. 
and um, where there's certain thing owed, certain things owed, you can't repay them. You can't repay because they've given so much, and yet you have to try in some mm. way. And also, we spoke about education before. St. Thomas speaks about this virtue of observancia. We owe something to our teachers, those who have given. They've done all the thinking. <laughs> they've done all the meditation, and they're giving the fruit of that to us. And since we can't really repay them, because we can't every we can't give them anything, we have to give them this certain respect that St. Thomas calls observancia, and uh, he says that's especially due to teachers. Yes, well, and so you have there's many different cultural things. For example, and you see the anti-cultural things such as people texting while they're talking to you or something like that. I mean, maybe you've had that example going on in, even at the dinner table or something. Well, yeah, dude. Yeah, well, you know, John Venere, just uh, our common friend, had yeah. just told me the other day and in his own house there was a priest present and a boy, young teenager, and um, he was, they were eating and he realized that the boy was texting under, <laughs> under his table yeah. and under the table and without concentrating at all. And I've seen it. You see how technology can break up these social relationships. I remember one plane trip. We were in an airport, I was in an airport, and I was just watching, looking around, and the, the seats were very close together, you know, one facing the other, and there was two parents and two children facing together, almost knee to knee. Each of them had their own device, phone or computer, and they were playing with it. No conversation whatsoever, because I watched and watched and watched to see if there's any, anything that would be said. No conversation whatsoever. They're in their own worlds, in their own personal worlds, don't tell me that's not going to have a profound social effect because that's unique. When we don't need community anymore, when we don't need face-to-face -face contact with people and building face-to-face -face friendships, well, what, what does that do? We don't realize that the inner fabric of our society is being shredded. For example, I just think these are two children and two parents, one yes. and father. I mean, what, how, do, how do parents parent? I mean, obviously they provide food and they, and, and they give them clothing, but it's in their conversation with yes. their children that they learn from their parents. I mean, absolutely. And, and, but this is really, this, is really the, this Facebook generation. I don't know if you want to call it that, but and, and just to try to justify my claim that this is shredding our, our cultural relations, um, Aristotle says that in order to be true friends, you know, in order to have a true state of friendship, uh, true friends have to share the salt together, which means, you, it does mean eating together, but it mm -hmm. means just this sharing of the day-to-day -day lived experience. And I, I probably salt is a good example because it has some flavor. It has some you know, common, uh, exciting flavor, but... Um, to share this all together, that's the only way these true bonds are achieved and to spend time and to really know the other person. That's the only way you can achieve true friendship. And then you can love them for their own sake because you truly know them. Otherwise, they're sort of useful or pleasurable friends, because, but you love what you get from them, but you don't love them because you, you don't really know them. So how can the Facebook friend be a real friend? And if most of our relationships, our friendships, our Facebook friends, what is that? Do we have any friends? That's the question. If we, and and we do, do we love anyone for themselves? Do we love anyone for their own sake, for who they are, for the goodness that we see within them? Yeah. That takes time. That takes awareness. That takes living together. It doesn't take an email. Well, we can't, we can't love what we don't know. Absolutely. Uh, we cannot love what we don't know. Yes. And so you have to know them to, in order to, and to, at least to love them at the level that they should be loved. And, and, and if, if, Father, you even can expand this to the level of God, how can we love him if we don't know him, if we don't meditate on him? Even Aristotle said that, you know, the greatest act of the human mind would be to medi meditate on the perfections of God. Well, if you can't meditate on perfections of God, if you don't know what God has done for you, then how can you love him? So, you, so in turn, even the, the student asks you in class every time, well, what's this good for me to earn money with? So he's really, he's limiting his own being to yes. making money and he's limiting his relationship to everybody else 
is whether this is useful for making money. Well, that's the thing that one of the necessary virtues in, in, in education is what they used to call docilitas, sort of this open, which means not just not being docile in the, in the sense of not uh, mindless, uh, yeah. mindless, but oh, being open, yeah. being capable of being taught, capable of being taught, being open to what you receive from another. Yeah. Or to even to be open to the world around you, what the world teaches you. But if we're always acting, if we're always giving our own opinions, if we're always conveying, twittering our own opinions to those who care for whatever reason, then how can there really be this quiet openness to reality? I, I, don't, I don't see it happening. And if that doesn't happen, what kind of human minds are you forming? So in this crisis, is it... Uh, in culture, you see it more in the youth than you see it in older persons, maybe or maybe not. Uh, maybe because the technology is, people have been brought up in technology rather than by human parents because they're twittering, uh, whoever they're twittering to, uh, they're, or sending text, texting messages, I should well, say. When you, when, you, well, when you read the books or hear the lectures of the people that you know, lived in the 1930s, and uh, you, they, always, they always would say that at this time, we always wanted to be old, seem older. We always wanted to dress like our fathers in order to seem older. Now you have the old trying to be young and, mm. and forgetting that there's a, there should be a fruition that's going on in the development of their lives. And uh, so you have sort of a trivialization of even the old and the, and the mature and even the way they speak, watch the way they speak. We're losing our own English language by reducing ourselves to a few words that can just get us by, but don't communicate reality. And that's one thing I always you know, point out to my students when you read these great books of Shakespeare, for example, how, look at the descriptions in those texts of, the, of what is presented there. Look at the description of the people, look at the descriptions of places. If you can describe the, these places, for example, Venice, in this way, well, that must mean you were aware and you understood what was there and you really looked at it and you saw how it was different from other places or other t uh, times. So, but if you lose those words, it means you've lost the concepts. It means you're not dissecting reality and analyzing reality and dividing it up as it must be. That's the purpose of the human mind, to understand the nature of things. But you have to sort of divide and analyze before you can understand the nature of things. So our, we're being really impoverished in our under appreciation of the world. So in, in turn, that, then you can't communicate that to others because you don't have it yourself, one, and you don't have the words to, and therefore you can't pass it on to somebody else. And if you have a whole society that's lost the ability, what's next? Yeah. What is next? That's the question. Now, you, we mentioned also about the, the, this cultural crisis is that people lost a sense of modesty, that, they, that uh, they know enough not to get arrested, but apart from that, they don't know enough to preserve modesty for their own s s safeguarding, even their natural virtue or even their natural situation, or much more to saving their soul and saving the soul of their, of their brother and sister. It system. seems like a strange lack of awareness of even the concept of modesty, where you, again, you know what's going to get you arrested, but that you shouldn't, you know, dress this way in particular situations, or you shouldn't be out in public dressed like, dressed like this because it's immodest, because it attracts the illicit attention of other people from the, of the opposite sex. This, it's not even a concept anymore. And that's another frightening thing. We've lost the concept of modesty. And where that'll end up, I don't know. But uh, we've certainly lost it. Well, of course, we, we, you know, it was shocking figures to hear that, you know, that uh, children, most, most girls in high school, uh, not to pick on women alone, but have lost their virginity before they graduate high school. I mean, yes. I've heard numbers, terrible numbers like that. Whereas when I was growing up, that was not... It was not uh, yeah, it was over 60%, 70%. We're talking about, I'm sure, 5 or 10%, but nothing. Right, 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 yes. And um, 
You know, there's almost, and, and yet there's this, there's this diminution of this real femininity yeah. or a real sense of the romantic. Yeah. That's gone too. There's a sort of flattening out with go and because there's this ro there's this Latin word pudor, which sort of means shame, and it doesn't mean shame in in the sense that I'm ashamed of something. It means this covering of that which is powerful, this this veiling of that which is powerful. Not because you're denying it, but because you're keeping it within control. Because you know it's powerful, and you know it's it's good. And yet you, you, you veil it because it, in order to c control it with the shame. And, and, you know, for the ancients, this, the idea of the blush was a, a big, they write about it all the time, as this sign of modesty. And, the, and they always cite it as something beautiful. I mean, even they have Plato in his dialogues, he, he, there's examples of that. And uh, the sign of... I hold something back. I don't sh expose everything, because not because it's weak, but because it's powerful. Yeah. So these are, these are I mean there's, these are various cultural expressions. Whether how people even eating. I was we were talking about uh, when I was growing up, and if a phone call came to one of my brothers or myself, we'd have to tell the person calling that I'm at dinner now with my family. I'll talk to you later. Right. Whereas today, I mean everything's. The, the family unit, even when you guest together, uh, best time at least would be, would, would be the dinner table. Whenever right, right. The mother and father are home, the children are home from school, right. our university, and, and we exchange then our day. We find out what's going on and, and, or discuss whatever's interesting mm -hmm. to us. There's a, there was a cultivation of family life and the life of the table, yeah. even cultivation of, of how we eat, and that's a cultural manifestation also, which has basically been destroyed, and it's going to take hard work F uh, amongst families, individual families and small institutions to try to recreate in some, to reconnect them to the ancient tradition. But I think in our own situation, since we see this chaos outside the walls, you know, in so many different er domains, we have to really try to cultivate our, our families as, as peaceful kingdoms as much as we can. So, so in, in, in eating or, or, or even having a cup of tea or coffee after dinner or, or just, you know, uh, uh, reading the newspaper or sharing stories, I mean, all of that, uh, people are living more and more in their own little world and not, and not sharing. Absolutely. And time's going by and, and, the, and your children are not being formed by you. That's another thing. The, the, the importance of the father of the family really trying to form the intellectual life and create the environment, intellectual, cultural environment of his family. I think it has to come from the father. The mother cultivates what, what is given, the image that is given, but um, he, they, the, the father has to really try to impress a, a, a vision of what is right, what, the way things should be. And I think many, many men are derelict in that duty. So uh, is there some, uh, this, uh, this, I think you've, you, I get the impression from talking to you that you think the crisis in culture is worse than even 10 years ago, is that, would you say, or, or 20 years I, ago? I think so, because we've been, we've been the ideas that are, have fueled the modern period are just having their effects now. They're seeping into every human relationship, and it, it's breaking us up, this radical liberalism is really breaking up those fundamental relationships. And, and, and these things, these cultural gestures, these thoughts, these holidays, the feast days, even liturgical life, even those who practice the faith, is there a real liturgical life? Does your family go through the liturgical seasons? Do they have meaning for the children? Or are we just immersed in the secular calendar? Well, I, see, I remember, in fact, you know, in our apostolate here, we promote the, the feast days, the holy yes. days. So obviously we, we have to work as well. So we give our employees a chance to the opportunity to choose to take the holidays. Like uh, January 1st is after all, not only the uh, first of the year or New Year's Day, yes. it is also the Feast of the Circumcision. Correct. Uh, January 6th is the Feast of, of the Epiphany, the, our Lord showing himself to the kings of the, of the world, yes. those who are faithful. And then, you know, Good Friday, which of course is the 
Now, but taking Memorial Day versus taking Holy uh, Ascension Thursday, they're both fall around the same time, right. not on the same day. But the whole idea is that Ascension Thursday is much more important than Memorial. We're remembering our final destination. We're, our Lord yes. went there on Ascension Thursday, and He wants us to remember that's our destination. And that's much more important to remember that than to remember some foreign wars that you know some people gave their lives for. Wonder, wonder for whether they were really for moral causes. Certainly, the recent wars are not. And and then you go on to the you, you go into the other ones like the Assumption, for example, the Ascension of Blessed Virgin Mary. Yes. So, but. I remember even a pious traditional Catholic saying to me, but I want to have my Memorial Day. What I'm right. saying, but you know, I mean, what are your values? I mean, what are your yeah. first values? I mean, well, okay, if I mean, you, you take work off on Memorial Day, okay, but what about, what about cultivating, because it's part of cultivating the life of the soul. Yeah. In, in Christian, uh, the Christian view of time, there, it goes forward, it's linear. <laughs> Yeah. Right, uh, one event is ghost. You start in the beginning of creation, you go to the end. Each event is unique, but the liturgical calendar you move sort of in a, in this eternal circle, and really that's it's necessary to bring your family into that eternal circle of the, reliving the life of Jesus Christ and His mother. So I think that if we're talking in the, these ways about the crisis. And the question is, well, what can I do? Well, one thing that can be done is cultivating the life of the Christian family by participating in, in this liturgical life of the church. Even if you have to bring in new customs yeah. and start new traditions that sort of foster the feast in the heart and minds of the children, of the teenagers, of the parents, Sometimes they have to be recreated and renewed and even just introduced something new. We, we, put, the, we put the initials of the, of the three magi over our door, door post, you know, and, and the Feast of the Epiphany. And there's a blessing and the child goes around the house sprinkling the holy water or yeah. some kind of recognition, a participation in that feast, which is a participation in the life of Jesus Christ himself. Yes. So we can, we can be doing those things, and of course the other thing is too, when uh, you know whether it's even offering the chair to a to a person who's older yes. on a bus or something like that. That's a, I mean it's a, a small gesture, but all the same. I mean obviously the younger person, generally speaking, has better health and has more strength, right. and therefore can do that. Whereas the older person may not have the strength or the health. It's a funny yeah. thing, but we used to know, used to sort of instinctively know who you give a seat to. Yeah. You sort of knew if they were older or if it was a woman or you sort of knew. Yeah. They sit in their own, you sit in your own seat and you just grab it yeah. <laughs> and now yeah. and there's no sense of what I should do except for the, I mean, there's the rare occasion you say, and once that happens, when someone gives their seat to another, you say, the civilization is not dead. Yes. Yes. So it, it, it still lives and we have to hope that it lives and we have to act as if it's going to live through our actions. Well, I, I'm also reminded of the life of Saint Teresa of Lisieux. That you know that there was a a nun that was when she was doing the washing, she would splash. You know, if she wasn't aware, she was. Yes. I guess maybe meditating, but she was splashing all the water over Saint Teresa. So she she took this as an asperges, so like well, this is, what the, <laughs> this is what the priest does when yes, you know, yes. he sprinkles holy water. And so she t she sanctified it. She accepted it. She sanctified it. And she made it her business also right. to smile, to, especially to those who were more difficult to live with. So and I mean, the, the important thing also is that it, it brought that up in her mind. Yes. The, and, and it ha gave it a religious dimension yes. because of that per constant participation in the, in the high mass. So in turn, so, you know, as it says in scripture, you know, all things work together unto good for those yes. who love God. So even if a person is doing something harmful to us, even intending to do that harm, if we take it in with the eyes of faith and say, well, God has given me this opportunity to grow right. in virtue. God has given me this opportunity to offer this suffering to for the salvation of souls, yes. for my own sanctification, for the suffering souls in purgatory. Yes. All of these things. So we can, the first part of the culture really is, is the interior, which is how we think about it, how we react to it, and, and, and giving it to God in whichever way Absolutely. we're inspired to do. Uh, mm -hmm. So this would be something that we can, everyone can do in their own life. Absolutely. But of course, we can, if, you, if, you have, if you're a parent or if you're a teacher or if you have companions for that matter, I mean, if, if they're open to being taught something, you can teach them Absolutely. how to be, how to be more... Uh, and just bring it up, even yeah. though it may seem awkward or silly, 
bring it up and, and yeah. give them this new dimension of reality because the supernatural is sort of uh, thinly separated from the natural. I mean, yeah. there's, there's a veil, but it's close by and, and the saints are close by and the angels are close by and we have to remember their presence yeah. by cultivating their feasts and, and remembering them in the, in the day-to-day -day activities of life. Yeah, so, and so there's, it's not beyond, but nevertheless, we, we do need to be aware that around us, there's been a cultural breakdown that wasn't there yes. even 25 years ago. Or, Absolutely. Uh, and, and that we have to do our part to encourage people and enc remember ourselves as well to, to be uh, more aware of the person around us, next to us, beside us, behind right. us. And whether, of course, even in driving, I mean, I've seen people get angry at driving. I mean, you know, they, this, they, they want their way, they want, you know, but, and when you're just, everyone's just obeying the law of the road, not, right. not, not even, you know, but they, they, it's, it's like it's their road and nobody else belongs <laughs> on that road but themselves. Yeah. So we need to... Uh, the ultimate uh, culmination of liberalism, yes. Well, yeah, liberalism, yes. of course, is the, the doctrine of liberalism is that I'm free to do what I want and get yes. out of my way right. uh, in case because uh, you're bothering right. people. Rather than the Christian <laughs> idea, which is we're all God's children yes. and we're supposed to help each other both to here and now, but with the final purpose of going to get into heaven, get into Absolutely. heaven, yes. So it's, uh, it's important that we do it. It's, uh, certainly the big things are important, but the small things, which are not so small, when they're done for the love of God, yes. nothing is small in God's eyes. Absolutely. So, and uh, I remember reading a definition at one time of what is the, uh, if, if you put God first in everything instead of yourself, then you're on the road to heaven. If you put yourself first instead of God, you're on the road to hell. Yes. And, that's, and, we, and we see those things in just in, you know, whether it's eating, drinking, uh, you know, St. Paul says, when you eat, when you drink, uh, do the, all things for the glory of God. Yes. And so we should, all these things, and of course, those will be seen by others and we'll help to build up the culture as well. I see we're running out of time in this program. Remember to pray the rosary every day. Our Lady promised that we would have peace when all our requests are request, granted, especially the consecration of Russia. Pray for the Pope to consecrate Russia so that we will have to see the reversal of the crisis in, in education, reversal of the crisis in, in geopolitics, we see the reversal of the crisis in, in the church, uh, in, in culture, and so forth. And thank you for being with us today. Thanks God so much, Father. Thank you. Thank you.